maximum height that we had or the maximum distance was 23 feet. And so I just project from today with my projector to the point that the image was projecting at exactly that right, that right distance. One of the issues with, with using the projection method is that your projector more or less basically is set up to project more or less the focal point is in the very center of your projector. There's always a little bit distortion on the outer edges, but it's kind of not noticeable. When you start playing with the projector and, and projecting down, this center focal point starts to do this. And it starts to become a little bit more noticeable that your images here in the middle start to become a little bit more elongated. So if you guys go outside, look at like the lion's cheeks, and you can see that just from projection, he's just a little bit of hair too big and too wide. His cheeks look a little bit too puffy. That's strictly from the projection. Had we done the, the grid method, it would, it would have been okay, but we would have run into more issues with the top of his head. Because with the top of his head, if we want to get a perfect circle, once we start getting into that geometry, we're more or less painting an old. With the grid method, for some reason, that oval ends up becoming just a little bit too pointed that the top of his head starts to look flat. So between the two methods, neither one of them is absolutely perfect. They work great for, for street art festivals and stuff like that. But the thing to remember too is, the further away you are from the viewing point, the more that these distortions are going to become obvious. So if you have a client that wants some kind of a little anamorphic feature that's maybe only six, seven feet across, you can get away with it with the projection method because the distortion of, of length doesn't really have an opportunity to become outrageous enough that it's going to cause an issue. So Kurt does have a couple of books out there that kind of explain his geometry a little bit better to some people. He's still kind of very intellectual and kind of hard to understand sometimes, but it's definitely, definitely worth digging in. One of the things that I had meant best to Kurt was We seem to gravitate, we seem to gravitate to the Renaissance artists the same as he does. We seem to go a little bit more towards Trompoy, whereas he goes a little bit more anamorphically. But what is it about that period of time that between both of our groups we seem to be drawn to? And his philosophy is, is kind of like in anything else, we build off of the artists of the past. We build up their work, the same as scientists and mathematicians will work off of the 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 work of previous mathematicians. But about 200 years ago, photography and a couple of other things came up, came around that really changed the art world. And artists started to go in a completely own direction and the sciences went in their own direction that we sort of somehow lost that continuum of art of building from one to the next. And so he's like, you know, if we want to really connect to the human spirit, we really need to be working off of that continuum of art that was built on previous generations. And, and I think that there's a really good point, you know, in that. And one of the things I asked her too is, you know, when we do these festivals, it's very, very communal. And it's very communal that there's a lot of really big name mural artists that are there, everybody's working together. And it's very, very much the feeling of salon. There's, competition is very much discouraged. Uh, it's all about the artists that work together have a much more better time. And it seems like the artists that don't really, that kind of have a problem getting along with the, each other, just kind of seem to fade out and, and disappear. Because everybody kind of loves the idea of playing off of one another and learning and having an opportunity to build these relationships like with Leon here, with other people like Annette Ronan that's playing with, with perspective, to have the ability to, to work with them and actually watch them work and watch how fast they work and ask them questions while they're working, but then also building relationships that if you're working on a job and you have an issue that you could be like, hey Annette, uh, I'm having an issue with this, what can you tell me? Well, send me some pictures and I'll show you. 
And then we'll take the time to just do a couple of like little drawings and be like, here's where you're off, that kind of thing. So the community itself is very, very much like, like a salon type of, of, of feeling. Sure. Is there any You know, I, I, there are a couple of smaller online resources, but I mean, they all seem to be based on the beginner level and not really, I think for us, the technical level that, that we're wanting. Like I said, I know if you go to Kurt Leonard's website, he does have a couple of books that he's either coming out with or just coming out with that have a little bit more of that technical ability or that, that technical knowledge that, that we would be looking for. So unfortunately, I think it's, this whole thing is so new and there's so few people that actually do it correct that nobody has taken the time to, to write it down and write in a book that would speak on our level. Like you can go online and find a hundred websites of people that are doing it on a small scale, like on a piece of paper, on a, uh, like on a tabletop, but nothing really at our scale. It's just more of an interactive, you got to get out there and do it yourself kind of thing. Eric, what is, what is um, Kurt's last name? Right? Wenner, W-E-N-N-E-R. Okay. So one of the things too that we see, one of the things that I asked Kurt was that there seems to be an overlap in style and technique between what we do and the street artists, but yet, most of the people in street art seem to come from more of a mural painting or street art background. Would you like to see more traditional artists enter into street art? And Kurt's answer was, studio artists all benefit emotionally from the experience of working in public. I think the art form needs the artist less than the artist can benefit from the experience. We're in a time where divisions between specialties are disappearing, which is just as well. And I do think that there's a, a fact to that, even from doing these, doing a lot of these festivals is instead of having that, that interaction with just the client, getting that interaction with the public and seeing how they respond and what they respond to is really, really informative and it really becomes something that I can take to my clients because I kind of can see how the client responds to different things. And I gotta be honest, like my, We've been doing the street art festivals for quite a few years now, and I personally always fought the idea of going anamorphic. And the reason that I always fought the idea of going anamorphically is if you're kind of not using Kurtz geometry, you're kind of stuck with the idea of putting a lens in front of your face. And we have such a hard time living in a world and creating something else that causes people to walk around like this. It's, I'm, we're so morally opposed to that, that there's been a couple of occasions that we've purposely distorted images to the point that they look great in person and look horrible in photos because we were trying to push that idea of the, the ephemeral nature of street art and chalk art is that it's temporary. And we were trying to push that nature to the point of, you got to appreciate it in the moment while you're here, while you're looking at it. But over the course of the last year, my philosophy is starting to change a little bit. And, and a lot of it has changed from my conversations with, with Kurt and the fact of, yeah, the public is changing. I have to kind of keep up a little bit. And then some other friends going, yeah, but here's what you have to understand. You can do a beautiful Mona Lisa on the ground and people are gonna come up and take a picture of it. And it's gonna be one of 22,000 photos that they have in their photo library that they're never gonna look at again. But my crushed Coca-Cola can spilling out with them next to it is the photo that they're going to share with their friends. And they're going to say, look how cool this is. Look at what I was, what I was able to experience. And I'm starting to kind of see the draw of that a little bit. And I think I'm starting to see the draw because more commercial clients are, they're kind of, they're, they're looking for that kind of experience and that kind of experience to bring to their clients. And a perfect example is we're developing a project right now where the client wants to, they have a craft brewery and they're looking for 
some kind of inter interactive kind of experience and they've had a couple of proposals and I walked in and I was like, giant beer taps, giant 3D beer, beer taps on the side of your building that are metallic that have the shadow that when you drive by, it looks like, you know, and then he jumped on the idea of, whoa, and it could look like beers coming out of one of them and that somebody can stand under it. Da -da 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 -da. So it's like even clients now are looking for that, looking for that selfie kind of kind of moments. So I think at, at the very least, it's really important for us to be informed and to see adding a little, a little bit more of this anamorphic stuff into our style. It's not as if something's new. It's something that goes back even long before the, the days of Andre Pozzo. But our clients seem to be looking for more of that stuff. And so it very, very much fits in with the long tradition of what we do. And to me, I don't think it's anything that's gonna go away short term. And I just think it's something that we should start thinking about that Trump is great and it takes a lifetime to master in and of itself, but to at least be aware that maybe I'm not gonna offer that to my client, but I know somewhere it's in the back of their mind. And maybe I can convince them to stay with the Trump, but it's a better thing. But I know at some point I'm gonna to have to educate them the distance between Trump and anamorphic. And one of the reasons that anamorphic doesn't so much work into, into a home is Trump can work to a, a larger viewing area. That, like on Pierre's lecture yesterday, you don't so much need to be standing in one specific spot to get the illusion that this molding is 3D. With anamorphic, it becomes one very, very specific viewpoint. And so nobody kind of wants on their wall that as you walk in the front door, you see like the, the William Cochran, the angel coming out of the wall. But then when they're standing here over their kitchen, looking into the living room, they see this distortion thing. So I think it can play in some aspects, but I think it plays really, really well in, in commercial applications. If you look at the lion outside, in actuality, he is 23 feet long, or actually a little bit under 20. Originally, he's going to be 23. So on the ground, he's 23 feet tall. Me standing there, let's see, if he's 23, which means his head is right here. If you're standing here with your foot, and if you're one of the people that have gone out there to pet the lion, your hand was typically three feet off the ground. So anamorphically, that 20 feet, and if here's your hand, that 20, that 20 feet becomes three horizontal feet, which to me is still kind of mind blowing that it, that it takes 23 feet. But if you were to think about it, I'm trying to think of who's, hey, where's Michelle? Can you do me a favor? Just stand right in the middle of the room. So right there is perfect. If I, if I wanted to paint her anamorphically, exactly where she is right now, if you think about it, look at from where your viewpoint is. Sorry. Where, where do you see the kind of like you're giving up for a skirt? It's kind of pretty much on the wall. So to paint her legs and shoes, to paint her pants, from taking from here all the way over here and then up the wall until the point where you paint her shirt. So that's kind of how that work it works. Sorry, Sorry Zubis, that wasn't planned. It was just spur of the moment. But it was great. Sorry you missed it. It, it was the best part of the lecture. So that's kind of all I have, unless anybody has any questions. Why? What's the done good? 
Yes, an actual projector like that. You know, either one would work, but the thing is always remembering that the, the, the circular nature of the lens is always going to give you an optical distortion. So, but yes. No, no, you're fine. So there are You know, the best thing I can tell you, and, and the best ones out there are, there are different street art groups. There are different street art people that you can find on Facebook, that if you see somebody that you like, follow them, because both of them will post their own little tutorials on, here's a project that just did over the weekend. Let me show you my process. There's not really that many YouTube videos, like I said, it's still, th there, there are some, but they're more like tabletop and they seem to be more related to graphic design. So I would say there are certain people out there, uh, like Annette Ronan being one of them. She, she does some great, and she's such a phenomenally fast painter that it's, it's like magic watching her stuff. But she's really, really good at posting pictures of her process and, say, and writing out her process saying, and she just did one last week in New Jersey where she wrote, you know, here's what I painted. Here's my process. I started in Photoshop. Here's my Photoshop image. Then I added this into it. And then I added this into it. And once again, I think anybody that's writing a book, for the most part, they're going to write it at a very, very basic level that I think most of us are already past. And so the best way to find the technical knowledge that we're looking for is just seeking out those individuals and just keep following them on Instagram and, and, and Facebook. And like I said, most of them are so giving with their information that it's so easy to ask, how did you do that? And, or, hey, I'm struggling with this, any advice? And a lot of them will be like, yeah, give me a couple of days and I'll walk you through it. Heidi has a question. How did you start there? Well, the way that I started is my daughter and I, my daughter and I went to a street art festival in, in Sarasota and she looked and she was like, we can do that. And so the next year came around and we applied, they let us go. And our attitude of doing this whole thing is always go big or go home. And so for our first time out, we created this big elaborate whatever and completely fell on our asses. It was horrible, it was whatever. But the community, for the most part, everybody was like, it's not really that bad. Like, you got to keep going. You got to keep trying. It was very, very encouraging for us to go to go back. So we went back a couple of times, but always kind of kept that attitude. And as a community, one of the things that I really like is I don't think we get a lot of opportunities for experimentation. I think we're, we always talk about how we want to experiment, but we hardly ever find the time. And very not very often do we find a, the client that's willing to allow us to experiment. And a perfect example is I had all these metallic pigments in my studio and my daughter's going, we need to incorporate, incorporate this into some of our pieces. And so we started playing around at a couple of festivals of, you know, maybe if we brushed the metallic pigment on, didn't work, blew away or blew all over the place. And so she single-handedly started playing around and found through experimentation that the best way to do it was a mixture of metallic pigment and Coca-Cola and making it into a paste. And that the sugar in the Coca-Cola was just enough to not only hold down the metallic pigment for a couple of days, but also was the solution that it didn't end up very brush stroking. She could apply it enough that it would actually kind of level itself out and become very, very mirror-like. But I don't think there's many opportunities that we get to play like that, that other people would come up and be like, oh, how'd you do that? That's really cool. I've tried making them into chalks, but the binders always seem to dull down the, the whatever. So once we got onto that, and then with, I like it from an artistic point of view, but my kid is the one that on her 18th birthday came home to me and said, hey, guess what? I joined the circus. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, yeah, we're gonna travel to all 50 states. And I go, when is this happening? She goes, day after tomorrow. <laughs> so, so after her circus experience and coming back and, and doing a couple of chalk festivals, 
the one thing that she talked about about circus life was the community feel of the circus performers. You're working 16, 20 hours a day. You're living in close quarters. Everybody becomes a tight knit family. And she goes, that's kind of what the chalk art is. And so from there, we we're able to get into some international festivals and meet other artists. And it's been a truly phenomenal, rewarding experience. Evan. Yeah, that's a question. Now, uh, we know that with everybody having a cell phone and a computer that, and from the Photoshop, in post-production, there's a lot of things that you pass off of the looking murals that have been doctored up and presented through social media in a way that is kind of disingenuous. So as a street art community, is there a backlash against post-production I would say very much so. I would say, I mean, although color enhancement, because you're working outside, you're working in the sun, a lot of times you need to do color enhancement in order to correct to do, to do colors, but to do anything past the fact of, oh crap, my perspective was wrong. I'm going to go back in and fix that. It's it's yeah. kind of looked down upon, like, look, if, if you didn't get it the first time, just go out and try again. That's the way to correct it. Don't, you know, and show your mistakes because part of this is it's such a temporary thing. You're never going to do everything perfect. And part of street art is that it's considered more of a performance art than it is a, a fine art. People are coming up for the weekend to watch these things come together. And so, to think that you're going to do it perfect or even to show the, the, the public or make them perceive that things are perfect every time actually does them a huge disservice. And I think I kind of know where you're going and I, and I agree. And this is a discussion we have at my studio all the time that everybody makes these time lapses of these big projects and they make it look so effortless, but you never see the guy in the corner crying that he can't get his paint color right and he's kicking his paint over because he takes that up for production. And to me, that does a big disservice to people because when they go to try to do something for themselves and reach that frustration, they think, well, hell, that guy on Instagram didn't come across this. I must not be as good as him. So I think the act of actually getting out there and people seeing how hard it is and that you're sweating and that you're doing all this stuff is, is rewarding, not only for the artist, but I think it gives the public a certain insight into any type of art and the process that we have to go through. Yes. Can you use grid on the street or just method? You can use grid on the street. Typically, you know, when we use the grid method, we'll go out there with uh, like a construction chalk line and we'll actually create our grid with, uh, with a chalk line. And if we're doing just even a regular piece that's not anamorphic, we'll create the grid on our image, and then just use that that grid method on on the ground. Like another. What's that? Exactly, exactly. So if this is my grid right here, this is how it looks in perspective. So if I wanted to paint a straight line. That straight line in perspective is going to follow to that vanishing point. So I need to distort my grid like this to make this line appear straight. So, like it, it's. Could you do a demonstration with the film? A demonstration with the, on here, you mean? Yeah. Yes. So in, well, it's not really so much that the top because the ellipse part is gonna remain the same, but it's how you draw the ellipse and where you're gonna see it from perspective. So, if I were to draw that cylinder and if I were to just lay it on the ground and you see it in normal perspective,
it, it's going to look like this because how I draw it, how I draw it, it's gonna look kind of a little bit distorted because of the fact that I'm laying it down. When you create a cylinder and when you're looking at it, you're always creating it for eye level. How much of the top of the cylinder do you see according to where your eye is? But if you lay it on the ground, you're drawing it as if your eye level was in the middle. And so it's just your brain kind of reworks it that although what you're seeing is a trapezoid, your brain works it out that it's a square. Like you don't notice the perspective that, that you're in. And so if you wanted to do that same thing, but if you wanted to make it look like it's standing up, the cylinder part would probably remain about the same depending on the height of it. Because once again, if, well, actually it would be distorted. I take that back. If you wanted to see that much of the cylinder, then that part of the cylinder means that you would probably be a couple of feet below eye level, right? So let's just say that we wanted this cylinder to be three feet tall. Using the lion as the example, to get that three feet tall, that cylinder would be roughly 20 feet tall. In actuality, in actuality, it would look like that, something like that, because the distortion increases as you go back. It's one of the things that in a way, doing a circle as it goes back becomes really, really, the reason that you see a lot of globes and people doing round things is because it's kind of like a technical challenge. So whenever you see somebody do like a globe, it's kind of them saying, look what I can do. And everybody else that knows how hard it is goes, ooh, it's a perfect circle. Does that answer your question? No. Anybody else? That's a good point, and, and I think it is. I think we're in a balance between the professionally edited YouTube videos where people see the quote unquote magic, but then I think we're also in a phase now where people are looking for their own creative outlet. And so I do think people are drawn to seeing the process and seeing the mistakes. And I think that they can relate to them because anybody that, that goes into a creative endeavor knows that you're doomed for failure at some point. And so I think people find it a little bit more relatable. I kind of relate it to music and how almost instantaneously there's this huge backlash building against auto-tune that when people sing, they put it through a computer and it sounds perfect. And even young kids in my kids' generation are starting to move to the point of, I think I prefer the imperfections in somebody's voice than the canned sound of auto-tune. So yeah, I do think that there's a fact that people, I, first, my personal belief is through computers and the filters of social media, people are having a hard time connecting with other people. We might have more access, but we don't have true connection. And I think people find connection through failures and, and imperfections. More authentic. Yes. yes, exactly. It's more authentic. All right, given that, I'm going to end this on a high note. <laughs> Sorry. I was gonna just I was gonna say goodbye to all the zoomies. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I just wanted to jump in the bed. Eric you mentioned Eric mentioned these wonderful artists. Come on up. And your latest mural in New Jersey. So I was lucky enough to be part of that part of that crew. I was hired by the designer woman from California. Your name is Tracy Lista, and Annette was a guest artist. So if you're ever in New Jersey, there is a huge American Dream Mall near Giant Stadium, and Tracy created your tilt museum there. So she used this metamorphic, 
<laughs> that effect. So you can actually see how it's implemented in a neurons. So in that museum, it's like a maze and each corner or each wall create this effect of something that is not there. So like, for example, like when Eric explained to, to paint a person who stands over there. So you start painting feet here and he's gonna be in a corner and uh, he has to be somewhere there. So then from a distance, you see it as it is. So it's a wonderful, like, I was like, oh my God, it's like blew my mind. And Annette was there, she made four, two pieces actually there. And it was some other people. Like I said, it was amazing. And you can see it in person if you're ever there. Also, if you follow Eric on the Facebook or me, be connected to Annette. So you can sort of like find your to us. And like I, he said, she's amazing, amazing artist. And you can just like, you know, figure it out how it's getting done, but it's just mind blowing. <laughs> so sorry to jump. No, no, I'm glad you did. It just, I wanted to let you know that you can see it somewhere. Like, so not just trying to, since you ask about where you can find the information. But one of the things that I would recommend to anybody, even to those overseas, like one of the biggest festivals in the U.S. is the one in Sarasota. It takes place every November, and they're always open to applications and new artists, and they will put you up, and they will feed you, and they will give you supplies. And so to me, for salon artists, it would be a great opportunity to kind of flex those creative muscles and, and try something else and see how this other world kind of goes about creating a lot of the same things that we do. And I think some of that will kind of absorb and some of that will kind of shed onto them, which I think would be a beautiful thing. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.